Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Alka Singhal, Associate Director of Radiology at Medanta Medicity Hospital, Delhi, India. My area of focus is ultrasound. Anything to do with ultrasound, I work with great zeal and passion to achieve the best diagnostic results in a given scenario. Today, here we discuss evaluation of a post renal transplant doctor recipient where we will discuss the grayscale imaging, color and power imaging, spectral doctor imaging. By all these, we aim to evaluate the immediate complications and the delayed complications, the perinephric collections and the sinister vascular complications. Hope you enjoy the video. History of renal transplant. As we all know, renal transplant has come a long way from the first transplant between two monozygotic twins to that between brother to sister and then to between father and son and now between two friends like in case of actress Selena Gomez and actor Francia. Now, why do we need renal transplant? For the treatment for end stage renal disease is chronic dialysis or to go for a transplant. Advantages of going for transplant is there's better survival and better quality of life and this is owing to better surgical techniques and better immunosuppression and better donor and recipient matching. Of course imaging is a crucial component in the evaluation of renal transplant. What is preemptive renal transplant? When we do a renal transplant before the point of deterioration of the kidney function to the point of dialysis. So especially this is valuable in cases of children and adolescents. So this advantages are the lower risk of rejection of the donor kidney, improved survival rates and improved quality of life and it avoids dialysis and its complications. The surgical technique. All must make a note of the surgical procedures followed and the CT if you have any variation in the renal anatomy and the renal vasculature anatomy. Typically, at an open surgery, the renal graft is placed extraperitoneally in the right iliac fossa. If for robotic renal transplants, there is often a flap construction and they are partly intraperitoneal. Now, the transplant has three main anastomoses between the artery to artery, the vein to vein and the ureter. So, the renal artery anastomosis is end to side anastomosis between the donor renal artery to the external iliac artery or we can have to the internal iliac artery and different factors such as diabetic and age of the patient are taken into consideration before finalizing the plan. In case of a child as a recipient and donor as a mother, common iliac artery is chosen for the lumen size compatibility. The renal vein anastomosis is an end to size anastomosis between the donor renal vein and the recipient external iliac vein. And the donor ureter is implanted in the superior respect of the bladderdome. Now, how does kidney look on gray scale? Similar to as a native kidney, as we have all been scanning, we will assess the size, the orientation, the echogenicity, the corticomedullary differentiation, any hydronephrosis, any calculi, any mass lesion, any perinephric collection, any vasculature disturbances and we will use the help of color and power and spectral doppler for further assessment. A transducer frequency can be increased to a higher frequency transducer as and when it is permitted to get better image resolution. Common abnormalities, hydronephrosis as we all see, clinically it presents with rising 3M creatinine and the differential diagnosis is often chronic rejection where you can also have mild hydronephrosis. But in cases of transplant kidney, as a kidney is a denerved kidney, it's very important to reassess after emptying the bladder to exclude any false positives. Look for any stains as well. The incidence of renal calculi in post-transplant kidneys is higher owing to hypercalcemia and secondary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism and patients do not feel the typical colic as these cases are denervated kidneys. The perinephric fluid collections a very common indication for a renal graft Doppler ultrasound. What is the role of ultrasound? One to see if there is any collection, if yes measure the size, give a volume estimate characterize it whether it's a seroma, hematoma, uranoma, 
lymphocele or an abscess. How? We will come to that. Given an atomical relationship of the collection with the important vascular structures and other structures in the abdomen. Seromas are usually composed of clear serous fluid and they appear clear and echoic on ultrasound. Urinomas again are a urine collection. They will appear as clear and echoic areas and on sampling they will show elevated creatinine levels as compared to serum creatinine levels. Hematoma fluid will classically show the appearances of blood and depending upon the age of the blood. Lymphocene, again they are clear anechoic collections and the fluid created in here is equal to the serum creatinine. Of course, differential cell count and WBCs would be elevated in case of lymphocene. Abscess will show typical appearances of pus and there would be associated clinical history of pyrexia. Perinephric collections are significant based on their size and location. If they are small and they are exerting no mass effects, they can usually be left alone and followed up with serial ultrasound. Larger collections and we may cause obstructive effects, may be obstruct the ureter, cause hydronephrosis or obstruct on a vascular pedicle and compromise the perfusion of the kidney. These may need decompression either by any form of drainage or surgical management. Commonest that we see is a seroma, which is a clear anechoic collection along the margin of the kidney and the differential diagnosis is urinoma. Perinephric hematoma are common mostly post biopsy cases where there is a small subcapsular collection or maybe large subcapsular collection or it may track down to dependent areas and away from the kidney itself as well. And depending upon the age, it will have varied appearances and it can be quantified and followed up with ultrasound. Urinoma seen between the transplant kidney and the bladder again as an anechoic collection and the collection increases in size over a short period of time. Percutaneous tapping will show elevated creatinine and consistent with a urinoma unlike in case of a seroma or a lymphocele. Urinomas are secondary to urinary fistula or leaks and they occur in the post-operative phase usually within the first two weeks and clinical signs obviously include decreased urine output and fullness and tenderness in the operative bed. Treatment, they need prompt treatment and decompression. First, we can try with four leaks catheter. It may sometimes heal that small leak or percutaneous drainage or percutaneous nephrostomy or if that fails then surgical treatment may need to be instituted. Rare complications of urinoma include due to rupture urinary ascites or ascending into the thorax leading to urinary thorax. Lymphocytes are usually seen in the later part of the transplant about one to two months or more and they are caused by leakage from injured lymphatids at surgery and these are anechoic, they may contain septations and if there is any echogenicity within the collection, it suggests secondary infection and needs to be evaluated further and treated accordingly. Peritransplant abscess is rare but can be seen and they are usually a sequelae to pyelonephritis or secondary infection of any pre-existing perinephric collection such as urinoma, hematoma or seroma or lymphocyte. Fever is often seen along with signs of mass effect and needs to be investigated. Any patient who is febrile and any prairie transplant collection should be assumed to be an abscess unless proved otherwise. The infection may ascend into the kidney and may develop into intrarenal abscesses and when more fulminant emphysematous pyelonephritis may ensue where gas shadows are seen within the renal sinus. Coming to the applied anatomy, the vascular anatomy, the main part that we want to assess here and understand. So as we all know, the main renal artery, when it reaches the renal hilum, it divides into the dorsal and the ventral rami, which further divide into segmental arteries. And they're usually five to six in number, apical, anterior superior, anterior inferior or middle, inferior and posterior segmental arteries. We identify these and we sample the segmental arteries at least at the three samples at the three poles of the kidney and sample the renal artery at the hilum and the origin. The renal artery has to be traced from the anastomotic side to an area before the anastomotic side because we also have to sample the external ileic artery and part of it. So the renal artery has to be sampled all in complete total. Also include assessment of renal vein 
and external ILAC vein and we record the PSV, EDV, RI, SAT and acceleration index with all the samples. A depiction of the color Doppler, it is easy to identify origin of the renal artery from the internal ILAC artery with appropriate color Doppler settings which can be very nicely demonstrated. Here is another demonstration showing the main renal artery as it is arising from the external ILAC artery. So, which ones are the segmental artery? I hope it is all clear. Again, there is another schematic diagram, a comparative anatomical and an ultrasound correlation to show the segmental arteries. Identification of these is very important because these are the ones we aim to sample during our renal graft Doppler evaluation. So, here we have sampled right kidney upper pole segmental arteries and as we all know the typical renal arterial flow signature is a rapid systolic upstroke and a, a diastolic flow and the RI is normally between 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. So we sample the middle segmental arteries, the lower pole segmental arteries, renal artery at the hilum and the renal artery at the origin and we sample the renal vein the normal waveform is continuous and monophasic. We sample the external ILAC artery which shows resistive flow. How to optimize our Doppler settings? We can use a higher frequency transducer whichever gives us the required depth of resolution and renal transplants are mostly superficial so we can go for a higher frequency transducer easily. We can use harmonic and compound imaging as well. The most important thing is not to apply any probe pressure because this will compress the vasculature of the transplant and will impede the diastolic flow and increase the resistive index and optimize the Doppler settings of PRF, velocity, range, wall filter to maximize the performance. Just a table illustrating the various factors that need to be reset every time because each patient's body habitus changes. So even though your machine has been optimized by the application specialist, you still mean, may need to adjust the factors for appropriate results. So using the transducer frequency we discussed, transducer pressure should be minimal, Doppler gain highest possible, avoiding the noise, Doppler filter is the lowest possible to detect the slow flow and PRF suit the velocity range of the required area. Complications of the renal graft as per the ultrasound findings. So, based on an ultrasound findings, what are the differential diagnosis of the complications that could be happening to the patient? So, increase in size of renal transplant, you could be looking at rejection, infection, or thrombosis, venous thrombosis. A decrease in size of renal transplant, you could be looking at chronic ischemia or chronic rejection. A high RI values could be seen in acute tubular necrosis, obstruction, infection, severe rejection or extrinsic compression. Low RI could be seen in arterial stenosis, advanced arteriosclerosis or AVF. And hydronephrosis could be seen in cases of obstruction, stone, clot or any anastomotic stenosis, edema, neurogenic bladder or bladder outlet obstruction. So coming to specific cases now. Acute rejection, what do we see? One, the kidneys enlarged, edematous, may show globular outline like edematous and roundness. It may be hyperechoic or may show increased renal parenchymal echogenicity. The thickened renal cortex and their loss of corticomedullary differentiation can be seen. And the central sinus echoes are ill-defined due to extensive edema due to rejection. Of course, biopsy will confirm the diagnosis. On spectral Doppler, the findings are non-specific elevation of RI over 0.8. Chronic rejection, kidney small in size goes on progressively reducing, shrinking and there is diffuse thinning of the renal cortex. Again biopsy is needed to confirm the diagnosis. On spectral Doppler, non-specific elevation of RI is seen over 0.8. So coming to post-transplant acute tubular necrosis. This accounts for majority of cases of renal failure occurring within the first few weeks of transplant. Again, they clinically present with decreased urine output and elevated creatinine levels. What do we see on ultrasound? There is graft enlargement, swelling, and the kidney is edematous. There is obscured corticomedullary differentiation, usually hyperechoic kidney, however, scattered areas of increased patchy ecogenicity may also be seen. At times the kidney may appear completely normal. On spectral dropper again what the finding is non-specific elevation of RI. Coming to the next the renal artery stenosis. Now 
we have a short transitory from the anastomotic side to the time the renal artery enters the kidney. So, renal artery stenosis can be at the site of anastomosis, before the site of anastomosis or after the site of anastomosis. Majority or 50% of the cases are seen at the site of anastomosis and usually the end-to-end -end anastomosis have three times greater risk of renal arterial stenosis. The spectral Doppler ultrasound shows focal elevation of the velocities at the site and parvus tardus waveform in the distal part beyond that. This is a sample case of renal artery stenosis showing peak systolic velocities of about 400 centimeters per second and in the renal parenchyma the segmental arteries show parvus tardus waveform. Coming to the renal arterial thrombosis. Renal arterial thrombosis could be global when the main renal artery is occluded or could be focal depending upon the segmental arteries that are thrombosed. Accordingly, we could have a wedge-shaped parenchymal impact or total loss of the kidney, which could be appreciated on color or power doppler as area of no flow and further imaging is needed and urgent intervention is needed to rescue the kidney. So, this is a case where there is hardly any flow seen in the renal artery thrombosis case and post-surgery the kidney has been reperfused and showing normal diastolic flow. A just a differentiation between the three things acute rejection, acute tubular necrosis and vascular complications all are present clinically similarly but they are all managed in a different manner. Diagnosis is really, really important because there are timelines for that. Acute rejection is managed by immunosuppressants. Acute tubular necrosis requires supportive care. Vascular complications often require urgent surgical intervention. Coming to renal vein thrombosis, again this can present as slowly going renal failure or acutely going renal failure with decreased urinary function, swelling and tenderness. Ultrasound findings usually include enlarged kidney, reduced or absent venous flow and increased resistance on the arterial side, reverse diastolic flow on Doppler. So initially there may be elevated RI, loss of diastolic flow and later diastolic flow reversal. So this is critical to recognize depending upon the time that you recognize and you put in corrective factors you may be able to salvage the kidney otherwise the renal function deteriorates eventually the patient is back to dialysis as in the case that I'm just about to discuss. So here there is a sampling done at the renal hilum and the spectral Doppler waveform shows characteristic diastolic reversal and this was proven this is patient is currently under dialysis. So a little bit of differentiation point if the renal vein is patent then we think more of ATN versus rejection if renal vein is occluded we think of renal venous thrombosis. Other rarer complications that you may come across is AV fistula and pseudoaneurysms which are often post biopsy and show typical aliasing and the vascular flow patterns. RACS, renal allograft compartment syndrome, rare but needs surgical intervention to rescue the kidney. PTLD, post transplant lymphoproliferative disorder due to immunosuppression, suppression is less often seen these days, I have yet to see one. Neoplasm this is a very important topic because these patients are undergoing immunosuppression. With immunosuppression, there is 100 times increased risk for malignancies and commonly skin cancers and melanomas. So that needs to be evaluated. But beyond that, for the kidneys, there is a tenfold increased risk of renal cell carcinoma, more so in the native kidneys. So an evaluation of the native kidneys is also a part of renal transplant Doppler evaluation. Please remember, evaluate them as well. Do a complete thorough evaluation. Thanks for watching till the end and I hope you like the video and find it useful in your day-to-day -day practice of evaluation for renal transplant recipient. Remember, these patients may often have deranged renal function where contrast CT abdomen or CT renal angiography may be contraindicated. Hence, reliance on your color doctor evaluation and spectral doctor evaluation is all the more important for the physician to make timely important management decisions.